So um, start with naming legislation, what authority can should be used. Really consider what, what are the impacts on public facilities. What are the needs that are created by the facility? And it's qualitative and a rational relationship. What are costs? And, you, you do this at least in your head, and you ought to do it on paper. Um, when the burden on public facilities exceeds tax revenue considerations and the like, it's appropriate time to put in exactions. Okay. And so um, Exhibit B, again, is, is uh, sort of a checklist of things to consider when you're thinking about exactions. Okay, so we spent a lot of time talking about these niceties, so I want to talk a little in the time that remains about using handling applications, making recording decisions, appeals, and then um, I probably won't have time to go over the developer improvement. But basically what the developer improvement agreement in Exhibit A simply does is say what the developer is supposed to do. And as Bernie's conditions, the first thing that you say is you comply with our decision. And hopefully this, the decision, and the plans, and hopefully the decision will include things like what you have to do. But then you identify, the example is building a road in the, in the developer improvement. What you have to do. More importantly, it includes when you do it. Because if you're trying to draw on surety, most letters of credit or um, performance bonds say, we are, and we are uh, securing performance of the agreement. Well, what happens if something goes wrong before the guy goes belly up and walks away? Something that goes wrong during construction. The bonding company or the bank is going to say, nah, we don't owe you anything now. He hasn't finished. So you want to have a developer improvement agreement that says we can draw on the letter of credit or the performance bond when there are ongoing problems. We don't have to wait till the time period for performance ends. So that's, that's the, probably the most important aspect of that agreement. Okay, getting to the decision. Um, applications, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I think most boards, they get an application, they look at it during the acceptance process. Is it complete? And then it gets filed away in a desk drawer. I think it's wrong. It's also true for zoning boards. What's the first thing that you look at when a zoning board gets an application. What are they asking for? Bernie's case where the court said, do you need a variance or do you not need a variance? Okay. The zoning board application should clearly state what is being requested. And then you can decide, okay, if we grant the variance or the special exception, is there anything else that needs to be done? because you have this bouncing back and forth. Well, you got that variance, but you didn't get this one. <laughs> okay, so applications should address that. They should also, there is also a requirement that they, a copy of that goes to the administrative official, and that includes variance applications, not just a, appeals from administrative decisions, so that if the person didn't fill out the application completely, and if your uh, administrative official isn't involved in the process of filing an appeal, which I think may be helpful to have them, um, they may not know that what has been stated isn't really the real reason why there's a problem. And so you spend all that time and money going through the process, and it's not what the person needs. But the information provided is useful. Okay, on a zoning board application, the, the second thing that it tells you is why the person thinks they're entitled to relief. Special exception, administrative appeal, or variance. 
Now, why in the world would you use that during the hearing process to say, does the evidence support what he said are the reasons for each of the five criteria? Substantial justice, property values. It's supposed to be stated in the application, so why not look at what the applicant says? That's a first line of defense. And it's a first line of trying to decide if the application should be granted. So don't just file it away. You don't have to agree with what's said. But if you look at it, it's really what is the best case scenario for the applicant if the application if the applicant has done a reasonable job of filling out the application. They've done half your work for you. Thank you. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. Okay? So it's not just boilerplate. It determines jurisdiction, whether or not you can act. It determines whether you should accept the application. It'll set deadlines. It provides, as I've said, substantive help in reaching a decision. So uh, in considering your applications, do they help in who accepts? Does it say where it's filed? Does it say when it's filed? Does it say, uh, you know, what, what happens? Uh, plan ahead, okay, you get a deadline starting for both boards, you get a deadline created for beginning the process, you also get a deadline for ending the process with the planning board, not with the zoning board. So plan ahead, are we going to be able to consider this application? Look at it and use it for that purpose. And nowadays, you can't, on a planning board, say, oh, we're at day 65 or day 60, we need new studies. Can't do that anymore. So you gotta think ahead. Um, so, um, make the acceptance process useful too. Docketing and control, if you don't have a docketing and control system and a tickler system to remind you when deadlines are coming up, um, say hello to court. Um, you can still require the applicant to pay studies, but you can't tell him that he's got to pay for a study at the last minute. Um, who needs to know that an application has been filed? Helpful to have procedural rules on that in your regulations. When we get an application that does X, Y, Z, and it's in this zone, do we need to notify the Historic District Commission if you have one? Okay. Notice. Um, notices to me sometimes read like they're notices to invitations to come to a cocktail party. You are cordially invited to attend and <laughs> appear by council or otherwise, okay? Uh, or it's a, like a legal maze. And I love the ones that don't say what town it is. If you happen to know the address of the, the meeting place, you'll know where it is, but you know, it's nice to look. Um, I spend way, way too much time looking at legal notices. Um, don't subsidize the media, okay? Even though you may not be paying for it, you know, the notices that have the same thing over and over again for six different hearings that night, and each one is preceded with all that boilerplate, the papers don't need that much money. They're already making tons of money, okay? So combining the notices makes it a whole lot easier on the people who are reading the notices uh, so be considerate of who's reading the notice. Um, content should be who, what, who, why, where, when, and how. That's all in the paper. Um, read your notices when they're done. Uh, if you're not writing the notices and a secretary or somebody else is doing it, read them to every once in a while. You don't have to read every one, but read them every once in a while. Read others' notices. Do they give information better, more concisely, more understandably? You know, just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean it needs to be done that way. Combine notices when appropriate. I said, don't forget to identify your town. Use the internet or your website, but you can't use it as the sole means of notice yet. That may be coming sometime, but it's not here yet. Okay. Um, it's also a good way to give out supplementary information, make it available without people having to come to town hall and waste paper. Okay, and proofread. Proofread your emails too. 
I love getting emails that I can't read because they've left out words. People just think, well, it's email. I don't have to worry about what it looks like or what it says. And also, here's another one. If you use Microsoft Outlook or some other uh, email handler that has reply and reply to all next to each other, move that button so they aren't next to each other. Okay. And if you attach something, don't forget to attach it. I do that way too often myself. Handling, is there a deadline? You need to know the first thing, is there a deadline? Can it be modified? All deadlines can be modified. There's just a process to do it. The best way to do it is by an agreement with the applicant. But don't use extended for six months or three months or two months. Set a date certain, June 30th, July 15th, not a month from now. When's that month up and what, is, what if the month is on a Sunday? Or 30 days, or worse yet, 45 days or something like that. You don't know, so set a date certain. Ex parte contact, I've discussed that in my paper and I really don't want to take the time. I, I want to take the time, but I don't have the time to take. It's not a good thing to do, period. Somebody comes up to you in the grocery store, hey, you're on the zoning board, right? What do you think about, thank you very much, I'm on the zoning board, I can't talk to you. Makes you real popular, but it makes you more popular or less popular more popular than if your activities result in a lawsuit or result in the board having to do it all over again. <coughs> Our Supreme Court has basically said that if somebody gets tainted, we don't have to look at how much they affected the process. They've infected the process and the decision is very likely to be invalidated even if they didn't have a deciding vote. So don't do it. Handling discretion is a better part of blabbing, so don't talk about it. Remember, in New Hampshire, it's the board that acts. An individual does not act on behalf of the board. Oh, come on. Um, coping with difficult persons. Um, I call this in my paper dealing with des lawyers and other undesirables. Um, don't let them get to you. But don't hand them victories. Don't make stupid mistakes, in other words. <laughs> know what you're doing, do it with conviction, and don't argue, don't single them out for bad treatment. You'd love to do it, but it doesn't work well. Okay. Lawyers do a miserable thing for land use boards, and that's at the end of their testimony or before you go into deliberations. Okay, here it is. Request for findings and rulings. Okay. We do that in court all the time, and a judge says thank you, and then the judge decides whether or not to look at them. The judge is not an administrative tribunal. The judge may or may not decide to look at them. Some judges just periodic, uh, re regularly say, third parties request for findings and rulings are addressed fully in my decision. <laughs> and then some are and some aren't. Um, but a board, because you are acting in what's called a quasi-judicial capacity, you have the duty to look at them. And you should look at them. Why? Because somebody took the time to write them, but more seriously, because they can help you make a decision. You don't have to agree with what the attorney is saying. The attorney is representing his client. That's his duty. But he's trying to get you to approve or deny the application. So that's providing information to you. So think about using it. Um, I'm going to skip way ahead because it's nine. And I want to leave time for questions. So um, I think my materials do a... Uh, a good job of discussing all this, and I knew I wouldn't get all the time. Um, but, you know, think about how you make decisions. A decision needs to be made by emotion. 
the motion needs to say why you are acting. I move to approve the application because. Those reasons are not written after the fact, after the board makes a decision. They should be part of the motion to make a decision. The notice of decision may be written. You might make a, t a tentative decision outlining some reasons and then delegate the writing of the notice to s of decision to somebody, maybe even a, your attorney, and then come back and actually vote on it. But you can't do it without coming back and actually voting on the, dis the, the notice and approving it. Um, and again, all this is in the material and you have copies of the slides. Um, one, one question that I get asked, can I write out a proposed notice of decision? Yes, you can. There's no reason why you can't, unless it reflects prejudice. Predetermination. Pre if you do that, make sure it's based that you've had at least one hearing and you've had evidence. You don't want to go in and say, well, I know we haven't had a hearing, but here's how I'm going to vote. <laughs> okay, not a good idea. Um, ask for time. If you need time, ask for time. Most developers, most attorneys will say, yes, I want you to reason this through and reach a good decision. Uh, conditions, you know. On conditional approvals, they can be conditions precedent, subsequent. Don't be afraid of conditions subsequent, which mean they're, they're done after you have finally approved the project, finally approved in quotes, but you come back and have a, usually have a compliance hearing to see if they in fact did comply. Conditions are only good as when and where they're stated, how clearly they're stated, validity that I've talked a little bit about, who knows about them and who remembers them. Okay. Kipler systems are great. Um, okay, not quite done. And this is the case of Hudson, the trustees of Clare versus the town of Hudson a few years ago. This is a classic case of everybody screwing up the town, the developer, the courts, superior and supreme, and the legislature. Everybody screwed up. But it all started with a town not being able to say what we did, why we did it, and what's we done with the money. The court talks about these being impact fees when they were not impact fees. They were exactions imposed as part of a conditional approval meaning here's some money to do a project. They were not impact fees. And the court talks, wastes waste tons of ink talking about impact fees that had nothing to do with the case. But they spend a lot of time on it. And then they start talking about, well, if impact fees, you have to do this. You don't have to do that with exactions. Except now you do because the legislature took the case and didn't know what it was doing either. <sighs> Gee, do you think I'm critical of somebody? <laughs> but the problem really started with the town. They, got, they, they mingled these dedicated funds with other funds. They didn't know how many of them were used, what they were used for, how much remained. No wonder the court was confused. Do not let this happen to you, okay? We lawyers often have trust accounts. Sometimes we have retainers from clients. Sometimes we get money paid to, for purposes. Boy, we got strict rules about how we have to account for those. Towns should be doing exactly the same thing. You don't necessarily need separate accounts although that may be a good idea, but it's expensive. You don't get bank services free. But boy, if you don't, you better have a good ledger system. And you better have somebody who knows what they're doing and you better use that system. Otherwise, you'll end up like this. I don't know how much money this talk costs the town of Hudson, but I can guarantee you they spent a lot of money that they didn't need to. 
And then the legislature takes all this stuff where the exactions, conditions, and those things were in 674, 36, and 43, which are the subdivision and site plan review statutes, where they should be. And then they move it into 674, 21, which is where the impact fee statute is. So what are these? They're still exactions, they're still not impact fees, but the legislature has now sort of equated the two, sort of, but not really. So I'll leave it to you to deal with that. Just be careful. Um, so do homework, know what you're doing, and more importantly, why you're doing it. Don't forget paperwork and bookkeeping. Keep a tickler file and really consider using a developer improvement agreement. I think that is a key to avoiding Hudson like issues. Take your time. Don't feel that you need to be rushed to judgment no matter what the attorney says. You need to decide tonight. Horse baloney. How is that for a good thing to say? Uh, I've had other things said to me, but uh, take the time to do it right. And take the time to build a record. If you go to court today, the, the land use appeals are what's on, quote, the record. The best way to defend and win is to have a record that somebody can understand and read. When you put together the record, you may not do it, somebody else will. Think of what a judge is going to do when he gets piles of paper that are not in any particular order. And if you get something written to you, or a picture given to you, don't go, thank you, and give it back. Keep it. Tell somebody that they want to give it to you, we are going to keep it at least for the duration of the case, and that may extend into a court appeal. And go to Staples or someplace else and get little exhibits, labels, and then have somebody, while this is going on, write down what exhibits are submitted and number them. You make everybody's job a whole lot easier doing that. I talk about that in the paper in the record. So with that, tips and hints, application can be useful, understand personal relationships, use hearings and develop records, understand when and how to make a decision. Use a developer agreement, and I'm here for questions now with Bernie. Sorry to have kept you 10 minutes over. Thank you. Crop TV.